Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Our guest today is Susan Benecki of the Carnegie Institution of Washington and the Planetary Science Institute. Uh, Susan has had quite an adventure in getting here. Uh, she has seen uh, Minneapolis and Kansas City and the highway between Kansas City and here. Uh, uh, Susan's visit is funded by the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Outer Planets Colloquium Series. And uh, I should mention you've, you've seen on the news about the sequester. Well, an awful lot of NASA programs, including this one, are kind of on hold because of sequester issues. So um, Susan, we may have gotten the last visitor out of this, this, this program. Um, she did her undergraduate work at the University of Arizona and her graduate work at MIT. And she is a solar system astronomer, primarily interested in the Kuiper belt and um, binary objects in particular. Um, tonight, we have a public talk at 7 o'clock in the Union Auditorium, where she will talk about the New Horizons program. New Horizons Project, which is a probe on its way to Pluto, and it gets closer and closer every day. Um, her presentation today is about solar system archaeology, what we learn from the small bodies in our solar system. Please welcome Susan Benecki. Okay, so I'm going to attempt today to um, tell you why I think the solar system and the Kuiper belt in particular is interesting. Um, and I've tried to tailor this so that you're going to get a little background and then I'll sort of get more detailed as I go into the more technical such stuff. Um, and I'm going to try not to talk too fast because I find when I'm in front of large groups I do that. If you guys have questions throughout the colloquium, please, please, please ask. Um, I've, I can change the, the length if necessary. So I want to make sure that you guys get out of this what, what you think you can understand. So um, as uh, Kevin said, uh, this work has been done um, through the Carnegie Institute of, uh, in Washington and the Planetary Science Institute. And I've put a number of my collaborators up here. Um, Scott Shepard works with me at Carnegie. Um, Keith Knoll is now at Goddard. Uh, Will Grundy is at Lowell Observatory and has um, worked with Melissa Brooker, who's here. Um, Jim Elliott was my graduate advisor. Uh, he passed away about a year ago, um, but he was an inspiration to many. Um, and Mark Bowie is now at Southwest Research. So I'm going to start out by giving you some motivation and background for why I think this is interesting, both in the context of our own solar system as well as this idea of extrasolar planets. Um, then I'll talk about our survey techniques, which is sort of how I got involved in this process. Um, I got involved in astronomy from the time I was an undergrad, um, but I just always had an interest in astronomy. Um, and I happen to be in, sort of in the right time frame for some of our surveys. Um, and then I'll talk specifically about binaries, why they're important. Um, I'll talk about some of the more physical processes in the Kuiper belt, colors, um, variability, light curves, rotation curves, and I'll define that. And then I'll give you some ideas about summary and implications. Um, and just in case you fall asleep during the talk, um, our take home messages today are that objects in the Kuiper belt in particular, but also in the asteroid belt, can be used as tracers for the giant planets as they've migrated throughout the um, history of our solar system. And also that characteristics in the Kuiper belt can help us to learn about the distribution of material in the original solar nebula. And I'll show you um, sort of a density plot of what we know from the giant planets and what we've been discovering in the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt since then. So the motivation for this is that the study of planets and small bodies in our solar system and also in others, if we can get down to certain size scales, um, can help us understand formation better. So in our, in our own solar system, we know we have the four terrestrial planets, we have the four giant planets, and then of course we have Pluto that's sort of an oddball. Um, and then we have all the small bodies, all the small stuff in between. Um, in extrasolar planets, we found extrasolar planetary systems, we found a lot of large, what we call giant Jupiters. Um, and a handful of small, smaller objects, Neptune-sized objects, potentially in the future Earth-sized objects. But the orbits are very different from what we find in our own solar system. Um, and there are a variety of different models for how you get these planets in different locations. And I'm not going to talk about extrasolar planets too much today, although that is one of the motivations in studying our own solar system, um, that if we can understand what we can sort of observe up close, um, that we can maybe make some extrapolations to what we think happened in other solar systems that we can't observe so closely. Um, so this has implications for giant planet migration, um, giant planet small moons, so we know our giant planets have moons around them, um, and then dust disks, which are sort of the best observations we can make currently of the asteroid belts and Kuiper belts and other um, solar systems. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about binaries because 
Um, those of you who've taken physics know about Kepler's laws. And so the sum of major axis and the orbital period of a binary system allow us to actually determine what that system mass is. And then we can extrapolate and learn about the densities or estimates of densities. And I'll, you'll see some slides related to that. So that's one of the reasons why the binaries are really important. This has similar implications to what was done earlier with binary star systems and how we've been able to learn about stars in the past and currently. I really like this image of the Beta Pictoris disk. So this was taken, um, these are Hubble images. And you can see, so this is a, just a coronagraph. It's blot, blotting out the light from the star. And then this is the main disk in Beta Pic, but you can also see sort of a secondary disk here. Um, and this is just a scale for 100 astronomical units. This is about twice as far out as Pluto is um, from our sun. And so we have in our own solar system a primary disk, which you could think about as the asteroid belt. And then we have the secondary disk, which you can think of as the Kuiper belt. And the Kuiper belt is actually slightly inclined to the plane of our solar system by about a degree and a half. So there are some similarities here. Um, now, there's a lot of discussion about whether this um, planet here around Fomal Hut is a real planet or not, but aside from that, Fomal Hut has this beautiful dust ring um, with the idea that if this, this is in fact a planet in the system, that this um, planet would be sort of helping to form this dust ring. And if you look at the dust in um, systems like this, you find, um, this is a uh, survey that was done, or some observations that were done. And uh, this red object here is actually an object in our own, in our own um, Kuiper belt, or between the orbits of <coughs> Jupiter and Neptune. And you can see it, that the black points, which are basically just measurements of the regions here um, at different wavelengths, match up to what we find in our own solar system. So the material that's in other solar systems is similar to what we have in our own. And to give you just a perspective, um, in the 1700s, we had Halley's Comet, and people knew about comets for a long time. They were typically bad omens um, for various kings, depending on which side of the wars you were on in the past. Um, in 1800, uh, the first, or 1801, the first asteroid was discovered. And when the first asteroid was discovered, it was considered a planet, because people didn't have any other explanation. Um, and some ideas thought, well, there should be a planet between Mars and Jupiter. But within a couple years, there were a lot more asteroids found. And so instead of being a planet, they decided, OK, this is really a disk of material. And we won't call it a planet anymore. We'll call it an asteroid belt. Um, and then in 1930, Pluto was discovered. And so this is Pluto's orbit here. Um, this is our inner solar system. So these are the asteroids. Um, and then this is the outer solar system and Pluto's orbit, which is rather wonky. Um, and then all of these other <coughs> objects which were discovered in the 19, in 1990, basically. And so for one thing, Pluto was sort of discovered 70 years before its time. If it had been discovered in the 1990s with all these other objects, it wouldn't have been really considered that special. But we now have some objects that are even more distant. So Sedna has gotten a lot of news, press, or press. Um, and then outside of this, we think that there is what we call the Oort cloud, potentially two different, an inner Oort cloud and an outer Oort cloud. We don't actually observe either of the Oort clouds directly. We observe comets coming in from all different orientations, all different inclinations, rather than just the plane of our solar system. And so our, our um, estimates from that is that there has to be a belt of material out there, a disk of material, a sphere of material out there that is, is providing our source, sources for that. Um, so I think I've kind of gone through most of this. Um, and then in 2002, um, we had our first binary object in the Kuiper belt. And so that allowed us to actually make some estimates about what the material was out there. Is it rocky? Is it icy? That sort of thing. And this is just a plot of the small body discoveries. So when I say small bodies, I mean anything that's sort of Cirrus size or, or smaller, maybe Pluto size or smaller, which is about 2,500 kilometers, um, about the size of if you take Pluto and Sharon, its moon, and put it on top of the US, that's about the size we're looking at from a diameter perspective. Um, and one of the cool things that happened is in the 1990s, this was sort of the advent of CCD cameras. Um, and so the ability to, you had a lot of photographic plate observations here, and photographic plate observations were hard to make large, do in large quantity. And in the 1990s, we had the combination of large telescopes, um, large, cam large format cameras, large format CCD cameras. And a lot of this um, upturn is discovery of asteroids and near-Earth asteroids because 
also simultaneous with this, people started worrying about the Earth getting hit by a near-Earth asteroid. And so there were a lot of studies that have been done, but this is when we first discovered the, the first object, and we've cumulatively discovered many more since then. Now, if we look at the asteroid families, or the asteroid population, um, I kind of think of the Kuiper Belt currently being in the state that the asteroid population was, studies were in like the 1970s, where there was sort of just a little bit of information and we made a lot of guesses as to what might be the case, what might be real. Um, and so we're sort of limited in the Kuiper Belt because of technology, we can only get certain resolution observations. But if we look at the distribution of the orbits, so these are orbits around the sun, inclination and some major axis, you see that there are clusters of, of objects here. These all have little names. They're typically named for the largest object in that region. And so all of these clusters are actually places um, where there have been physical collisions, so two large size objects colliding across, next to each other or into each other and breaking apart um, and forming these dynamical families. And so there are a lot of studies that are done of these particular families. You can actually m dynamically model and date back to when these families formed, so within the last billion years or so. Um, you can also look at the surfaces. Since we had some discussions out in the hallway about whether it'd be worth mining asteroids or you know, what, what could you do with that? Would that be economically useful? Um, maybe. Um, maybe some technological issues for getting there first, but um, in any event, so if you look at um, the spectroscopy of these objects, so this is basically just spreading out the wavelength of light. If you think of this as the rainbow versus um, sort of the composition. We have objects with large dips relating to um, different silicates, olivines, and pyroxenes. Um, and then we have sort of some more neutral objects here that basically just have sort of, you can think of them maybe as like the moon, just kind of not maybe bright and light, bright and dark spots, but not, not lots of um, minerals that you would be able to just look at and say that's, that's what it is. And so we'd like to do the same sort of study in the Kuiper Belt, and we can do some of these things um, in the Kuiper Belt. The main difference at the moment is that this graph of, of asteroids, um, each one of those dots is a different object, you know, is 100,000 or so objects. In the Kuiper Belt, we know of about 1,600 currently that we've cataloged, so we're sort of small number of statistics at the moment. So how do we go about discovering these things? Well, um, as a graduate student, I was part of a project to discover Kuiper Belt objects. Um, we started this in 2000. Um, at the time, there were a couple hundred objects that were known about. And uh, so this is a plot of uh, the, the sky. And this dark line is the ecliptic. And then these dashed lines um, it are the plus or minus 6 and a half degrees at the ecliptic. And each one of these boxes is the field for um, a camera that used to be posted on the 4-meter telescope at Cerro Tololo and the 4-meter telescope at Kitt Peak. Each one of these boxes has enough stars in it so we could get a good positional measurement, um, but no really bright objects because bright objects basically blank out your ability to find faint things in the sky. And I'll show you some pictures later that'll kind of clar clarify that for you. And then this is what the data looks like. So we took two pictures of the same piece of sky, approximately two hours apart. And then we used the motion of the objects to tell us what, what we're looking at. So the white stars, um, the, or the white points are the stars that we matched up. And then the red and blue objects, it's actually the same, the same picture. We're just in it with the computer coloring them so we can see your eye picks up red and blue pairs really easily. And the rate of motion of these objects tells us where they are relative to the sun. So if you think about it, if you look at the night sky and you see like a shooting star, you see a streak across the sky, right? And you, you can tell it's something moving fast. Um, and so the near-Earth objects are moving much faster in, from our perspective than the objects in the Kuiper Belt. So all of these little red-blue pairs here um, are objects that are moving much further away. And then these guys are the asteroids sort of between Mars and Jupiter. And so we use that information to tell us which objects we want to keep track of. We submitted all of our data to a place that um, keeps track of all moving objects in our solar system. It's called the Minor Planet Center. And it's based in Harvard um, University. Um, and so some of these asteroids have been followed up. Most of them have been matched up to something. Um, and then um, we took from this, and we wanted to learn more. Was there anything else that we could do um, to understand the data set? So we searched 800 square degrees of sky. 
Um, we had 300,000 some uh, measurements. We end up with 498 objects that we discovered. And uh, this is the full database of um, the Kuiper Belt objects that have been discovered to, I guess, a year ago. Um, and if you add these two together, you get the full amount. But the red group um, are those that were discovered through our survey. So we, we've actually managed to put basically a third of the database, um, contribute to a third of the database. We also had some really interesting objects. So we had a Neptune Trojan, which is an object that's in an orbit relative to Neptune that's 60 degrees um, leading or trailing um, in the orbit. So if Neptune's here, it's going to be orbiting here or here on that regard. Um, we had some really interesting objects dynamically from, so I mentioned Sedna earlier, and Sedna has put some significant constraints on various models that people have made for our solar system in the sense that in order for Sedna to be where it is, you can rule out certain scenarios for um, the formation of the outer solar system. Um, and then we also had uh, some other objects that were particularly interesting. They're individual objects. So I'm not going to highlight them right now. Um, and then in our survey, we also had um, a number of binaries that we discovered. And this was sort of the, the beginning of the binary epoch. So at the time that we did the survey, there were probably a dozen that were known. There are now 80 binaries that we know about in the Kuiper Belt. And that has been extremely valuable for us in terms of understanding this population of objects. So this is what the current population looks like. Um, it takes about 300 years for objects to go around the sun here. Um, and so basically you can estimate, we're estimating these orbits. When we observe one night, we have 24 hours on this 300 year orbit. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of play. It takes about three years to get an orbit that you can actually keep track of for something like 10 to 50 years. Um, so this is from the top down. The red objects are all, um, and I apologize, these two plots, the color coding is not identical. So the red objects in this plot and the blue objects in this plot are all in mostly circular, mostly low inclination orbits. We think of them as being the classical Kuiper belt. And so they have not been significantly perturbed by the giant planet since they migrated. The white objects in this plot and the red objects in this plot are objects that are in mean motion resonances with Neptune, which means that for every time Neptune goes around the sun, or every two times Neptune goes around the sun, for example, Pluto, sorry, every three times Pluto goes, Neptune goes around the sun, Pluto goes around twice. Um, and so these objects all have some sort of integer relationship to Neptune's orbit. Centaurs are objects that we think um, started in the Kuiper belt, got perturbed, and got sent closer to the sun. So in this plot, um, they're yellow. In this plot, they're orange. And then the purple objects and the gray objects here are called the scattered disk objects. And we think that those have been, they started off someplace in here, and they got thrown out when the giant planets were migrating. You'll notice that most of the large objects um, are actually in either the scattered or the resonance population. And we think that tells us something about where they originated in the original solar, um, solar system disk. Now, this is kind of a technical plot, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I'm sure I'll lose a bunch of you. Um, but this is just to point out that if we look at the distributions in the classical, the resonant, and the scattered disks, that there are distinctive, there are differences between these three regions, um, both with respect to their inclinations, um, as well as in respect um, to um, their size distributions and their, their magnitude distributions. And I know that's a lot of technical jargon, um, but it's just to sort of demonstrate to you that there are distinctive characteristics to each, of these, uh, proper, to each one of these regions that can allow us to sort of untangle um, what we think happened long ago. Now, I mentioned density in the solar system. So before we were able to find binaries or anything, um, in the outer part of the disk, uh, we have the terrestrial planet region. And I just put Ceres here as a reference point for the asteroid belt. The asteroids have densities that sort of range quite a bit. And then we have low densities in the giant planets. And the question is, well, what does it look like out here in the Kuiper belt? And then just to give you a reference point, this is ice at one, um, CO2 ice, and different um, other types of, of minerals that you might find, and then iron, of course, at the very top. So one of the goals of my thesis work and some other projects that we've done is to try to understand what that density 
uh, looks like in the outer solar system. Where did the objects come from, so to speak? And so binaries are a very useful tool for doing that. So this is the only slide that has math on it. Um, Kepler's law that relates the semi-major axis and the orbital period um, to the mass of the combined system. And then we have um, the diameter of an object also related to the brightness that we can measure and this parameter that we call albedo, which is basically how reflective is the object. You can think of it that coal um, or like the ash asphalt outside, you know, it, it basically just collects all of the light. But if you look at like a snowball or something or if you go outside and it was snowing out, you know, you get a lot of sunlight reflecting on you. So that's sort of the how reflective is the surface. Um, and then we can get some sort of estimate for density. And this is actually a schematic that's been put together by Bill McKinnon at the University of Washington, St. Louis for Pluto. So we think Pluto has a density of um, like 1.8. So we know it has more than just water ice in it. Um, so there's some sort of potentially hydrated rock in the, in the center, some water ice. We know that there's methane ice on the surface of Pluto, um, which you'll see in a slide tonight. Um, we also know there's nitrogen ice in Pluto. Um, and then Sharon, its spectra has a very strong water ice signature. Um, it has a slightly lower density than Pluto. Um, and so, you know, we can, these are obviously just estimates, guesses, based on the um, physical understanding that we have of these objects at this point. Can you get the albedo by uh, guessing what the surface composition is? It kind of depends. So for the Kuiper Belt objects, um, the albedos have been measured mostly with Spitzer, simultaneous Spitzer, and um, and other wavelength measurements. Um, for the Kuiper belt, there's about, I'm going to say, 50 to 100 objects that have albedos currently, um, probably about 50 currently. Um, in the next couple years, uh, there's this uh, instrument at ALMA that should allow us to make more measurements of albedos. In the Kuiper belt, we're really only working with the largest objects because they're the only ones that are bright enough for us to make these <laughs> measurements of. We'd really like to know. Um, what the smaller objects are, because the smaller objects, you, you take small objects and build them into big objects, but you'd like to really get a full size range. Um, but we're physically, you know, observationally limited. Over, over the course of years, you know, clearly the technology will improve and we'll have better ideas, which is why the binary is important too, because that allows us to sort of bootstrap different types of measurements together. But yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so um, as a postdoc, I worked on uh, Space Telescope, uh, my first postdoc, and we had a huge data set um, of 329 objects that were looked at um, using basically leftover time from other HST orbits. So HST has a 96 minute orbit, and of that, about 50 minutes of that is usable for observations. Um, and the way that they do it is that if you only use, say, 30 minutes of your orbit, there's an extra, um, you know, 20 minutes or whatever that somebody else can use. And so we basically had a program that said, if there's any leftover time, we want to take pictures. Um, and so our idea here was to um, you know, look and see which of these objects might be binary, and then to use those to make additional measurements um, and to learn about just the way that things have moved around in, in the outer solar system. So even, even the Hubble can't resolve the size of these things? That is correct. There's a handful of them that we've tried to do size measurements from. Um, Pluto, you can do. Um, and Eris, maybe Hyamea, but like the, the top, top 10 maybe. Um, but yeah, we, I have some data that I've been trying to model for a while of like the, the next tier down, and it's been a very hard project. So the uncertainties are like tens of kilometers, sorry, hundreds of kilometers instead of like tens that you'd really like. So, um, so this is just a sample data set. Um, so what I've got here in each one of these plots is the same. This is the data, and then this is if I if I modeled it with a single object, um, and then these are just the two residuals for when you subtract this from this, um, and then if you model it with uh, two objects on this side, and then what the residuals look like. And we do this mathematically as well as visually. So the visual is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And you can see down here, this is really obvious, right? There's two objects there. Um, and maybe this one's pretty obvious, but it gets more and more difficult the closer you get. Um, so we ended up from this survey um, of something like 40 objects, 50 objects that were binary. And then I had one object that I was looking at in the data set 
um, that gave me this bilobed residual, so sort of this bright and bright. Um, and so then I said, this is like a really close one. This one was already known to be a binary, like a wide binary like this one. Um, and so when we modeled it with a, a two component system, um, so this is actually a tertiary system. Um, and then this is actually just another object that was basically the same size. This was sort of our check. You, know, you always want to have a check to make sure that you didn't do anything screwy um, in your analysis. So this was sort of the yes, it really is in fact a double um, object at the primary. And then it actually has another satellite that would be like out here. It was quite widely separated. What's the period of these binaries? Um, they range from, um, say, six days, Pluto is six and a half days, um, to 20 years. This is the distribution um, from an observational perspective. So this is the magnitude of the secondary and the separation. So this is like basically how much fainter are we able to look. All of the objects down here um, have been um, discovered, all the circular ones were discovered using HST. We had a handful that we discovered from the ground. Um, and this just shows you their distribution relative uh, to the plot I showed you earlier, so the inclination of some major axis. Um, we have some that are in the resonant and the scattered disk. We have a very high concentration in the cold classical population that is not true in the other populations. And what this tells us, um, and in a couple slides you'll see the distribution of the, the orbits themselves, um, but what this tells us is that there's something different about the formation region here, that these objects were not as perturbed. Um, the binaries didn't break up the way they did in the other populations. And so that tells us that likely in these other populations there was a lot of interaction between objects, but in the cold belt there really wasn't as much interaction. It wasn't as, as disastrous there for the binaries. So the next thing I said, you want to get orbits. Um, so we had another HST program, and this is just the same object at different times, so you can see that we're, um, we, we had a special uh, computer program that, that we wrote to determine when we wanted to observe these um, and what we thought their orbits were based on um, periods and some major axes and such to make sure that we didn't, um, that we used HST time efficiently, because you want to do that. It's a valuable resource. We also collected color data, so we took these in two different um, wavelengths to learn something about um, sort of the surfaces of the objects as well. And we have lots of orbits. This is just a snapshot. Um, and I realize that some of these are hard to see, but you've got the primary um, and then the secondary at various position, at various times. You can see we've got some that are very elliptical. Um, we have some that are sort of more edge on. We've got some that are very circular. Um, and some of these actually get to the point where the primary and the secondary actually go in front and behind each other. And that allows you to do all sorts of really interesting science. And we had some observations earlier this year that I, you'll see at the very end of the presentation. Um, we're still trying to interpret what that data looks like um, or what, what it means, but um, we've got a couple objects that are doing this eclipsing thing that allows us to make even more um, understanding of their surfaces. Oops, wrong direction. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, I, this is the semi-major axis relative to the Hill sphere, which is basically, if you think about it, um, at any point, the sun has a particular amount of influence, and then um, the two components have influence on each other. So in, our, in the Earth-Moon system, at a certain distance, right, the Earth is pulling on the Moon and the Moon is pulling on the Earth, and if you go out to a certain point, then the sun's gravity overtakes um, the gravity field that the Earth or the Moon experiences. And so that's sort of that, what that is. Um, what that term is related to. And then the bottom axis is the excitation of the orbit relative to the, the helio, the sun, the orbit around the sun. You can think of it as, is it, um, is it excited, is it really inclined, is it in that scattered resonant population, or is it in that cold population? Um, and so the red objects here um, are all classical objects, and what we find is objects that are not tightly bound only exist in the cold classical population, which makes sense because if you had objects that were perturbed, that have interacted with planets or interacted with other objects similar in size to themselves, that they would not hold on to the extra components. Um, so this is telling us about the scattering properties in the, in, in the disk um, and how much they've interacted um, as they've migrated. Now, as I mentioned, the orbits give us some densities 
And in the Kuiper belt, you see we've got some objects. The first objects that we measured all had densities less than one, which kind of had us scratching our heads because ice, solid ice body would be one. Um, so this tells us that we've got a bunch of objects in the disk that are kind of rubble piles or have a lot of holes, empty space in them. And then we have a couple objects that are actually really dense. Um, this object, I think, is Quoar, and the uncertainty on this object is like one, so it could go up or down by quite a bit. Um, but this is sort of like a rock, like did it come from the asteroid belt or something as it, um, and somehow get captured in this. My understanding from talking with a bunch of dynamical modelers is that it's really hard to capture an object from the, Kuiper, from the asteroid belt into the Kuiper belt, but maybe there's a pathway, maybe that'll get figured out in the next couple of years. Um, but we have this whole range of objects, and so um, if these objects form closer to the sun, then you could have higher densities and then they migrate out. These objects are mostly the cold classical objects, so they probably formed in this area um, and likely have just you know, sort of stayed in that region over the course of time. Okay, so this is just a summary of sort of the, the, the science behind what I just told you. Um, so most of this isn't going to mean a whole lot. We have system masses, we have eccentricities that span the gamut. Um, the other thing I should say is that in the Kuiper belt, the binary objects are very similar in size to each other. So unlike the Earth-Moon system, where the moon is substantially smaller than the Earth, um, these objects are very similar in size to each other. The Pluto-Charon system, Charon is half the size of Pluto. Um, and the, the other objects in that region t seem to be equal size to each other. So this can tell us something about how these objects formed um, in terms of their interaction with each other. And there are a whole bunch of different models that people have come up with um, to explain how you end up with equal size objects in this part of the solar system. That's a whole other lecture. Okay. So now that we know something about maybe their interiors, maybe not their interiors in, in detail, but we know something about their densities, um, is there anything about their surfaces that we can learn about um, relative to their dynamics or relative to, um, once we know something about the binaries, can we extrapolate and say, well, if the binaries are in this situation, they all have low densities, maybe there's some surface observable, right? Not all the objects are binaries. It's, there's like, what, five to 10 to 30%, depending on where you're looking. Um, is there anything we can use from the binaries to tell us about the physical properties of the larger system? So colors is basically looking at the surfaces of these objects, um, and variability in light curves is looking at how these things are tumbling around. So again, we had another large HST survey. Um, I've had the privilege of working on some very large data sets that um, initially I was not part of collecting, but it's been really great to actually analyze this data. Um, so a lot of this work was, a lot of the original work was done by Keith Knoll um, and Denise Stevens, uh, who's actually at University, uh, uh, BYU. So we had some uh, visible and um, near infrared. Near infrared actually is pretty diagnostic in the Kuiper Belt because the near infrared hosts ices like methane, water ice, uh, CO2, um, nitrogen ice, which is harder to measure, um, but it's, it's kind of a diagnostic wavelength for ices in the outer solar system. Um, and we had a whole bunch of objects um, that were observed, some of them overlapped, and then there's been a lot of uh, research from the ground-based uh, observatories. And so we ended up with 300 objects in our final database. Um, and again, the idea here is to be able to look for something on the surface that we can correlate to something we think we understand from the inside. And this is what the colors look like. Um, so S is the sun. And you can think of the top part of this as kind of like Mars, uh, in terms of if you look through a telescope at Mars, it's, it's quite red to your eye. Um, and the sun, if you, I guess the best coloration for the sun would be like looking at the moon, it's kind of bland. Maybe not bland, but kind of gray. Um, and so we have objects that have all, these, all this range of colors. Um, and this is in the visible, and then this is when we look in the infrared. Um, we've got a couple objects that ended up with um, really different colors, and it turns out that in the Kuiper Belt, um, there is, so as you saw at the very beginning where I pointed out the asteroid families, different groupings of objects that have been broken apart because of a physical collision, these two objects belong to the only family in the Kuiper Belt that we know of, called Hi the Hyamea family. And they all have diagnostic water ice signatures. So if you take a spectrum of these objects, you'll see a big dip around 1.5 microns, which is where water ice shows up. Um, they're very blue in the infrared, which is why they're being um, brought out 
Turns out this data set was not published um, when it was first collected. Um, and so when HIMA was first discovered in 2003, this data set was actually taken slightly before then. So if this data had been published when it had been observed, um, they actually would have gotten the credit for discovering the HIMA family. Um, interesting how you, know, you take data and then you put it on hold and eventually you analyze it and publish it. Um, so we have uh, this distribution of objects. Now the second question was, are the colors different in those different dynamical regions? The, the resonance, the scattered disk, and the classical. Um, so this is the classical population, the scattered disk, the centaurs, which we'd like to know where they came from, where they got scattered from, and the colors might tell us something about that. And then these are the um, resonances that we had enough measurements at the time. You can see that the three to two population has sort of um, a, a full range, but they're kind of split into two, two groups. The centaurs are also kind of split into two groups, and there have been some suggestions and also dynamical models to suggest that maybe the centaurs came primarily from the three to two population. There's a little bit of back and forth on whether that's realistic or not, but some of the models, that works. In the classical population, we have a lot of objects that are really red, and it turns out that the really red objects, so those are the black ones in this plot, I think, um, are um, also in that very low inclination population. And so we think that that, again, is pointing to this idea that the cold classical population was very different than the other small bodies in the, in the belt there. Now, the, que the next question, of course, is, well, can you use the colors of the binaries to tell you anything about the rest of the population, right? You can get the densities. You maybe know something about, you know, are they more icy, are they more rocky? And uh, if we're looking at a surface property of non-binaries, is there any sort of correlation? So this was where we looked at the individual colors of the two components. So this is where I had to separate both of the objects and do measurements on them. And what you find is that the primary and secondary colors, um, you can ignore the little column over there. That was just for somebody who asked me what object was what. Um, all the red ones are the cold classical objects. This is actually a scattered object, so maybe it has some different properties. Um, but typically, the primary and secondary are the same, which tells us that we don't actually have to resolve these objects to use them to learn something else. And if you compare them to the larger population in the Kuiper Belt, um, this is a KS test. And what you find is that they're actually very similar in their color properties to the other objects that are not known to be binary, which tells us that if we learn something about the binaries, we can make some extrapolations to what we think is true of the larger population and we'll be kind of close. Maybe not bang on, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not a strange stretch to do that. Um, this is just sort of a, the different version of that. So this is the size, basically H, HV is the um, absolute magnitude, which is a size sort of a size effect, so you can think of big and small on this end. And this is the color. Um, we didn't actually look at anything really bright uh, with our system, so that the fact that there's no overlap there doesn't matter, and we didn't look at anything really faint. But you can see that they're, um, they're showing up similar to the rest of the larger population. Um, and so again, this is sort of just the conclusions from this, but the takeaway um, is that the binaries are representative of the larger color population in those different regions. Um, and so using the binaries to find out something about the densities and the compositions, it's not unreasonable for us to then use the surface properties and what we learn about the surface properties in the different dynamical populations to um, then draw some conclusions about the larger migration uh, process. Okay, and then the last part is to do with um, how these things are rotating. Um, and so this is the most recent project that I worked on, and I know some of the students have read the paper that I recently published about this. So um, we have a two and a half meter telescope and a six and a half meter telescope down in Chile. Um, and I managed to collect data on, I managed to have like 40 nights over two years, which was a lot of travel to Chile, um, but was really awesome in terms of data collection. Um, so we have 33 objects that we looked at, um, and I have another set of objects where I was trying to do light curves on the resolved binaries. That data set's a little bit more difficult to analyze because it requires extra modeling and I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and then I also looked at, uh, so the goal was to look at sort of the end member population, so the really large objects, 
southern hemisphere just because I was in the southern hemisphere and I had to look at objects that were there because you can't look at objects in the north, the earth gets in the way. Um, anything that was a binary. Um, and then um, this Hyamea family that I mentioned um, that is actually a collision family wanted to learn something about that population because it's likely to be different than the other objects in the belt because of that collisional um, situation. Um, we have some biases, so one of the things that you need to keep in mind whenever you do a survey is what are your biases. So, for example, in our um, survey for Kuiper Belt objects, we can actually de-bias our data based on where we looked and what our limiting magnitudes were. Um, you make the assumption when you're doing a survey for objects that everything at some point goes through the, the plane of the, the ecliptic plane that we were, that line that I, that I drew at the very beginning but not all in the same numbers, right? So objects that are along the plane, you're always gonna observe, but if you have an object in a weird orbit like Sedna, you're, if you find one, it means that there's a lot more out there because you just happen to find it at the right, to observe it at the right time to, to find it. Um, and in the light curve, it's the same type of thing where we have some biases in the sense that we wanna look at small objects, but it's really hard to get large telescope time to do lots of small objects. It takes. Um, the orbit, or sorry, the rotation periods for these are between eight and ten hours, um, which is about an, one night of telescope time. But you want to observe on more than one night to make sure that you are don't have any aliasing, that you're interpreting everything correctly. Um, and so to get uh, to get a four or five night run on a six meter telescope is almost impossible. Um, so we use the smaller telescope, the Dupont, to do the brighter objects that we could, and then when possible, Magellan to do some of the special targets. Um, and as I said, um, also long object, long duration periods. So if something's rotating really slowly, right, if you observe it for eight hours every night for five days, you're going to pick up something, you know, that has maybe a, a couple 20 hour period, but it, 14, 15 hour period. But if it's longer than that, you're not really going to see anything within one run. And so you've got to keep staring at the object and you've you got to rationalize what you're going to look at. So anyhow, so I just, this is just to mention that whenever you're making observations, whenever you're doing surveys, you always want to pay attention to what your biases are when you do your interpretations, um, because that, otherwise you could be seeing something that's not real. Um, and this is sort of a tutorial here for light curves, so this is very simplified. But if you have an object with a bright spot on it, for example, when the spot is very visible, then the object's gonna be bright, right? This is reflecting a lot of light, and the darker area is gonna soak in that light. Um, and as the spot moves out, it's going to get fainter. And then as the spot comes back, of course, it's gonna get brighter. And so you're measuring, um, so for a circular object, you'd be measuring that. For um, an elongated object, you're gonna see not very much light when it's like at the front part of this water bottle. You'll see a lot of light when you've got a lot of surface area less light and more light as it rotates around. And so that's what the second schematic is showing you there. So you end up with this double, this double peaked lobe. <coughs> and that can also allow you um, if it's to, to determine sort of how elongated the object is. So is it more spherical or is it more elongated? There are some subtleties as to how to do these interpretations, but this is sort of the, the basic idea. Um, and you can, depending on what side of data, sorts of data sets you have, you can do this extensive modeling. Um, so this is an object uh, that was observed by my colleague, Scott Shepard, and it had this very V-shaped part at the bottom of it, and you notice that this, this bottom is not the same as this bottom. And so when you model it, you can actually determine that this is two objects that are rotating around each other. So this was a binary that was discovered um, 300, approximately 300 kilometers separating it that was discovered through this light curve technique. This is kind of a cool discovery, something you'd like to find, but you can't always expect it. I um, think you can't do spectroscopy and uh, it's too faint. And yeah, it takes about eight hours of telescope time to do spectroscopy <laughs> on a single object. Um, you do have to worry when you're trying to do spectroscopy about these rotation curves, because the rotation curves are on average eight, eight to 10 hours. And so if you're sitting on an object to do spectroscopy, um, if the surface is inhomogeneous, then you would be concerned that you're measuring something at one time that you're not measuring at another. So this object in particular would be that, that situation, right? So this is actually Hyamea, um, and so it's really rapidly rotating. If you look at pictures of, of this on the web, um, they illustrate it as like an egg shape, um, and it, it is kind of that. So this is the elongation. Um, 
And somebody looked at it, um, another colleague of mine um, who's in Europe at the moment, um, looked at it in the infrared wavelength and the visible wavelengths and concluded from his data set, and the error bars are kind of large, so I still worry about this, but um, that there was sort of this bright spot on it and it's rotating in and out of view. Um, so this is sort of some sort of uh, water ice um, uh, spot on the surface. Um, as you mentioned, if you're doing spectroscopy of this object, this object is bright enough you can actually do spectroscopy in like an hour with Keck. Um, but if you were trying to do this from a smaller telescope, then when this spot comes into, into play, you'd have to worry about that. This object is actually rotating at three and a half hours, uh, or almost 3.9 hours, I think, um, which is actually about as fast as you can rotate an object that's basically ice. This object has a density of like 2.6. Um, grams per cubic centimeter, so it's, it, it wouldn't break apart, but there's also a physical limit that if you're rotating too fast, you would actually spin yourself apart. Um, so again, at some of the extremes, the light curves, if you measure something that's rotating really fast, you can say, well, then it has to be made of something other than ice, because if it was made of ice, it wouldn't be able to, to stay together. Okay, so this is just a sample of some of the light curves. I had, um, I think there were 30 some light curves in the paper that, it, we put together, so you can see um, this is basically doing a, a, a statistical analysis, looking for periodicity. You can see some of the periods come out better than others. Um, and because a priori, without a really long time base, you don't know whether it's that spherical object that's rotating with something on its surface or whether it's elongated, um, we basically plot these with two different ideas. One, that would be a single peak, this is the, the spherical case, and one that's the double peak case for the elongated object. Um, and then, you know, for the ones that we think we can decide one or the other, we use that for further analyses. Otherwise, we use both of those numbers and then we see how they fall out. So doing a statistical analysis of light curves themselves, uh, again, I've plotted uh, the cold classical population and the scattered and the resonance. So I'm using those as my distinctives, trying to understand this migration effect. And then the black line is sort of everything cumulatively put together. And basically what we find again is that the cold classical population is different statistically um, from the scattered and the resonant population. If you combine the resonant and the scattered population together, um, which sort of makes sense, they were both, they're both interacting with the Neptune system, um, then the cold classical population, it, it, it does definitely seem to be uh, very different and very unique. Also wanted to see if the binary light curves tell us anything useful. Um, and basically what we find is that they're not really, they're, they're still sort of seeing that these cold classical objects are different. Turns out that 75% um, of the binaries that we observe are in the cold classical population. So they're not necessarily going to, um, they're, they're all in this region as opposed to f filling the full phase space. But this basically just is telling us that we're not seeing anything different in the, in the binary population than we're seeing in the larger population. So again, it's not unreasonable for us to use the binary information to make estimations about the larger population. Now occasionally, we can actually do resolved observations from the ground. So this is using Magellan, and this is actually the discovery image for this object. So this was one of those, we followed it up to try to get the orbit and you get this beautiful picture and you know from the telescope immediately, like this is a new discovery, it's a new object. Um, and so this is the binary. Uh, we did some resolved light curve measurements and I also did this with different, um, different wavelengths, um, trying to see if, they were, if, it was, if there was any sort of spot on the surface or anything. So we basically have, in this case, the primary is completely flat. There's very little rotation curve on that, which tells us that it's rotating very slowly. Um, and probably it's, it's mostly spherical. And then we have the secondary, which had this very rapid, when we made this discovery, the secondary changed magnitudes by a half a magnitude in like 30 minutes. Um, so this object has some very interesting um, dynamical and uh, physical components. And we're still, after I got this beautiful data set, I then went back to try to confirm what I discovered and every single observing run I got snowed out. It was really frustrating. Um, but we keep trying to make observations. Um, and since time is passing, the geometry of the system is changing as well. So that has to be taken into, into account when we try to understand um, the, the system. 
And I'll just say that this is the data set that I have not spent any time analyzing yet other than preliminary. But you can see this is, again, from Magellan with excellent skies. Um, you can see that we can resolve the binary components. Um, and I've got five nights of data that look like this. So that'll be a really nice data set when I get into it. That's sort of the next thing on the, on the to-do list. OK, and I'd just like to finish up here by saying that um, one of the uh, one of our binaries is eclipsing and occulting each other. Um, and so what you see here, that's sort of a lot of, a lot of text. This was prepared for a different talk. Um, but these are the two components, and then this is a shadow. The, the, the gray area is a shadow of the primary or secondary on the other component. Um, and this is versus time. And so we're actually, the measurement I'm going to show you next is about this particular situation here, where the two components are eclipsing and occulting. So this object goes in front of the other. I'm going to, I'll come back to that slide. So if you think about a primary or secondary, and this is just the plane that they're orbiting in, they eclipse and occult each other. So you end up with no eclipse, and then a shadow eclipse, and then a deep, like once it gets completely in, and then the total eclipse. This is just sort of the geometrical, how do you model that? Um, but this is what the event that we did in February looked like. Um, and the orbital period for this system is 12 and a half days. The, rot the rotation period for the system, we think, is approximately half of that. Um, but the eclipse itself is approximately nine hours, nine and a half hours. So what we did for this, um, this eclipse was we combined data from the Canary Islands, Chile, and Hawaii in order to observe this event the entire duration. Um, to actually see this whole thing move in and out of eclipse. So we observed it from the time it was no eclipse to the shadow, to the deep, to the total, and then back to the no eclipse time. And uh, we had, those are just a couple images, so these are our, our comp stars. This is uh, the start and end, and this is for the DuPont telescope in Chile and for um, the telescope in Hawaii. Um, an, an, another graduate student was observing um, in the Canary Islands for us, so she provided just the data points. Um, and so this was, uh, the, the event started right at the beginning. Um, in the Canary Islands, they had a little bit of clouds at the very beginning, so there's no baseline here. This, this on this side should look very similar to this. Um, and then it came through the eclipse, and we picked it up at the DuPont here, so we had some nice overlapping data between the two of them. Um, and then uh, we picked it up at the IRTF here to get the baseline at the end. Um, and what we found was that um, the eclipse was slightly offset. The timing that we expected was that it would start about here and that it would end up in the bottom of the eclipse about here um, and then come out. So it was shifted in time, which tells us that we don't have the orbit quite right, um, but it allows us to refine what that orbit is. Um, and we also this is just modeled with a simple Gaussian, but I've, I've played around a little bit um, with this uh, model here, and it turn, turns out that you get a better fit of the bottom here um, when the two objects are not the same, not perfectly the same size as each other, difference of about 20 kilometers, um, and also differences in their reflectances, um, their albedos of a little bit as well. So we're still, we're still working to, to get this, to analyze this data set. We collected this back in February. Um, and so we'll be able to calculate the diameters, as I said. Um, I also have some color data, which I didn't put in this presentation. Um, one of the filters is actually significantly offset than the other, so I'm still trying to figure out why that's true. Um, and the other thing is that w for this particular situation, um, let me go back to this one slide here. So sometimes this one's in front of this one, and sometimes this one's in front of this one. And so to learn about both of the objects, you really want a combination of when they're flip-flopping to each other. And so we really want a whole data, data set. Um, and I know that um, uh, Melissa Brucker has been working on some of that data as well. OK, so let me just give you one more schematic. Um, these are just the same take-home messages from before. Um, but this is a picture that was given at a conference back in 2003, um, and I really like it because I think it's a good schematic of what we think is happening. So we have the giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and we have material early on in the solar system that was between these, these um, planets. Um, there's a model that's been put together in the last, say, five years called the Nice model, which looks at the migration of these planets, and sometimes 
Uranus and Neptune in their models switch places. Sometimes there's a, a fifth planet out here. Um, but basically, they come up with the same schematic of our solar system at the end. And so we have material that's between the giant planets. Um, there's obviously material in here. Jupiter, it turns out, is really good at kicking stuff completely out rather than bouncing it out into the, uh, the Kuiper Belt region. Um, and then these red objects are to represent the cold classical disk. And so what I would argue to you based on the data sets that we have is that this is actually a pretty good illustration of what we think is happening. So we have the cold disk that started out outside of the giant planets and basically just kind of got pushed outwards. It, it didn't, didn't interact a lot with the giant planets. Um, it probably started closer to like, say 20 AU and now it's at like 30 AU um, distance between the Earth and the Sun. Um, but it, we're finding that there's a population of, of stuff out there that just looks like it just kind of got pushed out and stayed put. And then we have these objects that we think got tossed out from between the giant planets that make up this hot population. So this is the scattered disk. And as Neptune migrated, it actually um, would have picked up some of these objects, but mostly these as well in the particular resonances with itself. Um, and then Jupiter migrates in slightly and Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune migrate out. Throughout all of this, you can easily eject material into the Oort cloud, um, both the inner and the outer Oort cloud. And we would expect that to be composed of some combination of asteroid-like and more icy objects. You accumulate ices the further away from the sun you are because it's much colder. Um, and so we observe those objects as comets when they come into the inner solar system. Um, and there is a lot of discussion about the comet population. Um, and that's, again, a whole other talk. Um, but this is sort of just the schematic I'd like to leave you with as to what we think our current um, model is for the formation of the solar system. Um, it seems to be fairly different from what the models for extrasolar planet systems have been. Um, the giant planet properties are fairly different. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see how this holds up as we make more measurements in the solar system and as we make more measurements um, in extrasolar planet systems and how those get modeled as well. Um, and then just to end, so the Kuiper Belt, um, as of August, um, I think it was, um, was basically 20 years old. So this is sort of looking at, you know, the asteroids were first discovered in the 1800s. And in the early 1990s, we had a whole bucket of knowledge about the asteroids. Um, and so, you know, where have we come in 20 years? Um, so our planetary system is much larger than we ever thought. Um, Alan Stern says that this is akin to not having maps of the Earth that included the Pacific Ocean as recently as 1992. So just to give you a reference point, a scale. Um, we know that planetary locations and orbits can change over time and that where we find these objects in the Kuiper Belt and in the asteroid belt as well um, are artifacts of that migration. Um, and also that our solar system and likely others, um, we're really good at making small planets because there's lots of small stuff out there for us to look at. So I'll stop there. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you all for coming at the end of a Friday night too. <laughs> yeah. So why aren't these little bits of matter throughout the so we have the near-Earth population and the asteroid population that I showed you at the very beginning of those plots. Um, one of the mysteries at some level is the fact that that cold population um, break, stops very ab abruptly at about 55 astronomical units. Um, there have been different theories as to why that's true, whether there was a passing star at one point that just chopped off the edge of the solar disk. Um, Sedna complicates the issue because in order to have Sedna in it, the particular orbit it has, there are certain timing constraints on when something like that would happen. Um, but no, there's small stuff strewn throughout the solar system. Um, the near-Earth material is more rocky. The outer solar system material is more icy. The comets, of course, are telling us some picture of, of, of in between. One of the interesting things that's come out in the last couple years, um, as comets have been observed in like the Stardust mission that went and collected dust, when they, when they analyze this dust, they're finding that there's um, a mix of material that the comets did not just form, like, you know, they didn't just form way out there, that there was a lot, of, a lot more mixing than models had originally anticipated between material and the, the refractory material in the inner disk and the outer disk. 
Um, and I'm not sure that anybody has a really good model or explanation for why that's true. It's just something that's come up recently that we're trying to understand. So does that help? Okay. Did you have a question? I had a question about the extrasolar planets, uh, the, the large gaseous planets, which are quite a bit closer to their sun than, yes. than ours are, and how that fits into this picture here that Bill has shown. Yeah, so I think that the... So I work with, I don't work specifically with them, but there, there are three people that are on my department, on my floor. Um, John Chambers, Alan Boss, and Paul Butler, who work on extrasolar planets. Um, and Alan Boss and John Chambers both do modeling. So um, they have various models for generating giant planets and migrating them. One of the mysteries, I think, at this point is why the extrasolar planets are so different from what we observe in our own solar system. Um, we know that there is, I'm thinking of a bunch of plots, I should have put those as backup slides in my talk. Um, we know that there's sort of a, a pile up at a particular, like a three day orbit or something um, for these giant Jupiters. And that has something to do with the tidal influence of the star that if you get closer you can basically get gobbled up um, and there's also a physical limit to how big you can be and be a planet rather than a brown dwarf or something um, this idea of migration I think for the Nice model came about simultaneously with these discoveries in the extrasolar planets I think that that sort of prompted a lot of the work for thinking about how our own solar system formed um, I don't think there's a good understanding why all these giant planets are really close I think what it tells us and I'm not a dynamicist by any stretch of the imagination in terms of understanding the, everything that goes into this. But I think the idea is that um, the migrations, um, I lost my train of thought there, sorry. Um, anyway, I don't think we really have a good understanding of, of why that's true. Um, but that the migrations in extrasolar planet systems are very different from our own solar system, and there's not a good explanation for that. There's now, I think, four or five systems that have more than one, like have, that have four or five planets in them. Um, you've probably seen some of the direct imaging pictures that have come out of, um, for example, the, uh, uh, the LBT and such, um, direct imaging of these systems, where they're all, they're all giant planets, right? We can't really see the really small stuff yet, although Kepler, I think, has 2,000-some Earths, super-Earths that they're, that they're candidates that they're looking into. Um, so I don't, I think it's still early to figure out why that's true. Um, but the solar system is at some level an oddity in that regard. So, yeah. Are there any triplets in the Kuiper Belt? Yes, we have, um, so we have the Hyamea system, which I mentioned earlier, which is this collision family. I, it has two moons. Um, and actually, a couple years ago, the two moons were eclipsing and occulting. Um, I know. Comparable masses? Huh? Are they comparable masses? No, they're very small comparatively. The, the three, the three but they're, it's a three, it, they're components. Um, the one that I showed you earlier. Um, oops, right here. So outside of that one, this was the first triplet. And in fact, in this system, so I'm not showing you the third component. The third component is off this image. But in this system, they all are actually very similar in size to each other. So it's, this is an example of the first triple system that they're all the same size. Um, now the Pluto system, which I'll talk about tonight, now has five moons. Um, and they're all, again, we think that's probably a collisional formation because they're all in the same plane. Um, but the other moons that have been discovered are much smaller than Pluto and Charon, of course. Um, so yeah, we, we keep hoping that we'll find, I've got another object that is kind of problematic in the analysis that the next thing to do is to model to see if it's a triple system, which would be really exciting. So we'll see. Yeah. In the distance versus density plot that you showed, so system, what accounts for the upswing and densities? Um, so I'm going to say migration primarily. Um, anything. So if you look at the formation of the um, solar nev it, the formation of the solar system, and if you look at where the materials would form, you know, closer to the sun, you burn off all the really, the really cold stuff, or not. You burn off all the icy stuff inside of about Jupiter's orbit. So when you're looking at comets 
comets typically turn on when they get to Jupiter's orbit. Now we've had a couple of really interesting comets that happen to have much more carbon dioxide than um, we expected, and they Hale Bopp is actually still active at 25 AU or something, um, which is rather unusual. Um, and then we had comet um, Hartley 2, I think it is, that is like if you calculate all the space, all the surface area that you would expect it to be active, um, it's, and then calculate how much stuff is coming off of it, there's more stuff coming off of it than possible. Um, and so that, again, is uh, combined with this spectroscopy indicates uh, CO2 ice. So there was a lot of heavy materials in the inner solar system and then icy objects or icy material further out. How much mixing happened between the two of them? Maybe there's been more mixing too, that stuff has been tossed out to the outer solar system and then accumulated ices on the surface. So they look like asteroids maybe, um, or they look like icy objects, but maybe there's more asteroidal material in the bottom of them. So good question, thanks. Okay. Let's thank our speaker again.